God is good. Amen. 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 Does anyone have a testimony they'd like to share? Just want to thank the Lord for all the blessings that He's bestowed upon me, even though I know I don't deserve them. But just thankful for what He done and thankful for Jesus and His obedience to die on the cross for my sins. I'm just glad to go back today and um, got part of my family here with me, so that means a lot. Well, um, Thanksgiving is almost upon us, and during this time of year, we should do this every day, but during this time of year especially, we like to reflect on what we're thankful for, what are some good things in our lives. We try and forget some of the bad things in our lives, but today um, we're going to talk a little bit about some special, especially good news, the good news of Jesus Christ, and what it means for us as believers and how we can reach those who are unbelievers. Um, so like, what exactly is our role um, with the good news? What are, how do we handle it? How do we bring it to other people? So I'm going to ask you a question, and just, just think of this. In your, in your heart and your mind. What is the first thing you typically do when you receive good news? Most people, I would say, um, immediately they want to tell someone. If they find out something, they either, uh, they'll post it on Facebook or they'll send a text message. Say if you buy something on Amazon, maybe you'll leave a good review. Or if you go to a restaurant and you really like something, you, you're going to give them four or five stars. <coughs> it's it's kind of like that way for us with our walk with Christ. We're called to tell other people. And morally, we should want to tell other people. We shouldn't want to be selfish and, and hide it away. Um, and one example, this is kind of a silly example, but just to set the tone, um, Walmart pickup. My mom first heard about it from a friend in October of 2018. And in December, I saw a Walmart pickup for the first time. And I thought, this is really cool. Um, and we've been using it ever since for almost three years now. It's really helped save us time. I know I can stop by after school and not have to spend an hour of my time getting groceries or anything. But then we told our family and friends and my grandparents, who sometimes have a difficult time getting around, now they can use it. And it really helps them not just saving time, but it helps them physically. They don't have to walk. They don't have to have knee pain or trouble breathing from going in the store. They can just um, get their groceries from the comfort of their car. So that's one piece of information. I know it's a silly example, but it's useful to some people. And the gospel of Jesus Christ is useful to all people. It's not something, again, it's not a convenience for us. It's not something that we personally want to store for ourselves, but it's something great that everyone needs to know. We are charged with spreading the joy, love, and knowledge of Christ. Why does this matter, and how do we know this is our calling? If you'll please turn with me to the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 8, starting in verse 27. Mark 8, verse 27. And Jesus went out and his disciples into the towns of Caesarea, Philippi. And by the way, he asked his disciples, saying unto them, Whom do men say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. But some say, Elias, and others, one of the prophets. And he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Peter answereth, and saith unto him, Thou art the Christ. Why is this important? Well, the Jews at the time, even a lot of the Jews who knew Jesus, they didn't fully comprehend the man who was before him. They didn't understand this is the Son of God. Sure, uh, a lot of them thought he was a holy man. Even some of the Pharisees, like Nicodemus, knew he was a holy man. And I'm sure some of the other ones who gave him a hard time, surely in their hearts believed, they just didn't want to have to fully understand, I'm going to have to give up my power. But they knew he was a holy man, yet they just didn't know, this is the Son of God, this is the Messiah. Even today, there are billions of people with misconceptions or no knowledge at all of Jesus. And that's really something that we should strive for every day to try and change. Uh, going to church is great, but if only our connection with Christ is on Sunday morning, 
we're not making a difference in the lives of our communities, the people who don't know Christ, it's not going to change if they don't go to church and we go to church and we're in these two separate worlds and we do nothing to reach out to them, we're not making that difference. We're not spreading that gospel, that good news. And we're keeping that, like I said, that wonderful gift from God, we're keeping it to ourselves. We Christians know the truth. We should help those that have gone astray just as Christ guided us. So, teaching the good news, what can we say? Well, you can turn with me to Romans. And I'm going to read several passages. You can follow along if you want. I might move a little quickly, though, so... Um, a, lot of, a lot of people like to use the book of Romans to teach non-believers or people who don't know much about Christ or even uh, new believers who are wanting to, wanting to grow. They teach them, this is, these are the basics, this is the good news. It's kind of that milk that Paul was talking about when you're trying to teach people for the first time. So the Roman road, as people call it, it's a <clears throat> Bible verses written by Paul that teach unbelievers about the path to salvation. I'm going to start with Romans 3.23. As I said, I'm going to move quickly, so if you can't follow along, that's okay. Romans 3.23, it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now that's not good news. We've all sinned, we've, come, we've fallen short. Nobody wants to fall short. We all want to have that success, that victory, that triumph. But here is our, here is our start. We're sinners, we're flawed, we're imperfect, we've, we've done wrong. So... How is this good news? Well, it says in Romans 5, 8, But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. There was someone out there, Jesus Christ, who loved us enough that even when we sinned, when we are flawed and perfect beings, even when we did uh, things that were hateful towards God, or we spitefully disobeyed his commandments, he sent his only son to die. He had a perfect life, and yet he died on the cross for our sins. That is good news. Um... And it's reaffirmed here in chapter 6, Romans chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I'll repeat that. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We were going to inherit sin. We weren't good enough. We weren't going to get that grand prize. But yet, because Jesus died on the cross for our sins, because he rose again and he overcame death, if we have a relationship with him, we can have a relationship with God, our creator, and we can get that gift of God, uh, the gift of eternal life. Uh, Romans chapter 8. What else comes of this great gift? Well, Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 37. It says, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Basic summary here. Nothing can separate us from, from God. Um, there are so many things in our lives that we try and accomplish, so many goals we have, and we think, this is a barrier, this is a wall, this is keeping me from getting where I want to go. Well, sometimes in life, that's the case, and it's unfortunate. But with Christ, nothing's going to separate us. The only thing that stands in our way from our walk with Christ is ourselves. If we're selfish, if we stick to the wills of the flesh, and we don't do what we're called to do, we're the only ones keeping us away from Christ. And finally, uh, Romans chapter 10. So we've heard about this good news. We've heard about this great gift. Well, how do we get this relationship with Christ? It says in chapter 10, Verse 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever is the key word here. Anybody, anyone can get that free gift. He didn't just say only the Jews can have it. He didn't just say only men can have it or only people who have obtained wealth and status or education in life. But he said anyone can have it. And again, like I said, nothing's keeping us from getting this gift except for ourselves. If we're holding ourselves down. So we have this gift handed to us. All we have to do, as it says here, call upon the name of the Lord. Believe in your heart that he is the Son of God. Confess it to the world. Repent from your sins. That's how you get this great gift. This is the good news. Jesus, the Son of God, who lived a sinless life, died so that we sinful humanity can have a renewed relationship with our Creator. 
Jesus rose from the grave, ascended back to heaven, and promised to return to bring the saints home. We need to share this good news. And morally, we should desire to share the gospel. We shouldn't want to keep it to ourselves. We should want to tell others about Jesus. Uh, but additionally, the Bible says this is part of our calling. If you'll turn with me now to Acts chapter 1. And I'll tell you now, this calling is directly from, from Jesus. Uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, Two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. We're called to tell others about Christ directly by Jesus himself. It's not a thing, well, this is a suggestion, or this is something I feel like I should do, but it's okay if I don't do it. No, this is what Jesus directly said we're to do. And here he's talking to the disciples, but he's also talking to us, all people who follow him. <laughs> and uh, so how do we do this? Well, we, like I said, we can start in our communities. Um, we can invite people to church. We can pray with people. We can talk to people at work or at school or at grocery shopping or anywhere. Um, we can show them what God has promised them. We can tell them the good news. Or we can also do it in the mission field. Not everybody's called to go to, to China or Kazakhstan or... Um, Africa or any other place on the earth where missionaries tend to go. Some missionaries even go other places in the U.S. Not everybody's called to do that, I believe, but we are to support them as a church or as individuals. We can do our best. We can pray for them. That is a tremendous way to support them, but we can also give them um, money and supplies, things that they may need. And if we're just there for each other as a church community, having each other's backs and working together for the call, that is how we meet this call right here. Even if we feel like we don't have the most direct role in our service, as long as we're giving our time, our talent, and our treasure, and as long as we're giving Christ our best, then we are meeting this call. And if you'll look with me now in 2 Corinthians, and I have titled this message, Ambassadors for Christ. You'll see why right here. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians 5, uh, verse 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we may be made the righteousness of God in him. So, what does it mean to be an ambassador? Well, an ambassador is someone um, like a representative of a group. They're someone who commits their time to help others, to promote the, the messages or the ideology of that group. For example, when I was in middle school, I served as an ambassador. Um, I helped new students. I helped current students with any problems they might have. And part of my commitment was not only in school was I supposed to represent, but out of school, through my behavior, through the things I said and did. I wanted to reflect good on my school. Well, the same is true for us as Christians. We made a commitment to Christ. We're given our life to Him. So whether we're in the church building or not, we still need to act the same. We still need to act like Christ has called for us to do so. And we're supposed to be good examples. Um, all things that we, we say, we do, we have to show other people what it's like to be a Christian. Unfortunately, this means people will scrutinize and closely observe us. This can put a lot of pressure on us. It can make us feel uncomfortable. Maybe it makes us feel like we just need to be quiet and not say anything, or maybe we need to, we feel the need to conform to the world or to give in this little bit to something sinful. But no, that's, that's part of being a Christian. It's, our life's not guaranteed to be easy. We have to, to resist that temptation. We have to overcome that awkwardness or that fear that we feel about stepping out 
And yet we have to do it anyways. We have to, to share that good news, no matter how we feel internally, even if we're um, outside of our comfort zone, it's still part of what we're called to do. Amen. Uh, now if you'll turn with me to another book written by Paul. This is Galatians. Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 16. Okay, so I've said uh, broadly, we need to stay away from sin, we need to do what God has called us to do. So here Paul is going to explain that a little bit more specifically. Galatians 5, starting in verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. You can't serve the flesh... And serve God at the same time. You have to choose one. And Jesus even said, you know, you can't, you can't serve two masters. you got to pick one. We can't serve the world and our own interests, but also serve God and Christ and fulfill the calling. We have to choose. It's part of that commitment. We have to choose God. But if you be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, immolations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And now reading this list, you think, oh, idolatry, adultery, murder, I haven't done any of those things. Well, if you think about it, Every day we do things to sin against God. So what makes us any worse than the people who commit these things that Paul's just said we need to stay away from? And Paul says here, people who do these things, they won't inherit the kingdom of God. We need to stay away from those sins, those temptations, <coughs> things that keep us apart from God and God's will. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Now these things, these are good things. These are the things that come from a fruitful walk with God, a fruitful life of serving God. Um, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. These are all things that we should want to have. And uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can have these things. And you may think, well, I've done what God has called me to do, and I, I don't have these things. Well, um, Maybe you need to reevaluate. Are you really doing what God has called you to do? If you don't have that love, that joy, that peace, all these other fruits, then maybe what you're doing is actually self-serving and you're just painting it um, as doing it for God. <coughs> and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. We are to work together in our walk with Christ, we're, um, we're to stay faithful, remain faithful in that commitment. Um, and now, a lot of these things have to do with us as Christians in our individual lives and us as Christians interacting with non-believers. But how do we as Christians and in, as ambassadors, how do we interact with new Christians, new believers, people who, they get it, but they don't understand the depth of it? Well, um, Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 5, lays out some duties of church leaders and elders. 1 Peter chapter 5, starting in verse 1. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Uh, church leaders need to be ready to teach and lead the congregation. They need to be good examples for others. And like I said, that doesn't just stop when you, when you walk in and out of the church door. 
Um, the church isn't even the building. It's the group of people we're around. And even when we're not around people in the church, we still have to be that example. We have to show people what it's like to be a Christian. And we have to be ready. If, if there's a, a, a believer who's struggling with something, we have to pray for them. If there's someone who doesn't understand something, not be like, why don't you get this? Or this is easy. This is simple. Or tell them, well, you're obviously not reading your Bible enough. But to be encouraging, tell them, this is what this passage means. And, you know, maybe start like a Bible study with them or send them some verses. Be willing to help your fellow believers. Don't look down upon them if they don't understand things the way you do. And a lot of things in the Bible are, are solid. Like, you can't argue that Jesus is the Son of God. But there are some things in the Bible that, that do have some level of interpretation. People may understand... <coughs> This is one thing, this is another. That's why we have denominations. Not everyone sees exactly every little detail from the Bible the same way. You have to be willing to, to talk with your fellow believers, walk them through why you believe a certain way. And if they don't understand something, a core value of the church, you have to be there, not to shun them, but to show them, this is what Christ has called us to do, and this is how you do it. We must remain in constant prayer for one another. Living the Christian life is not a guarantee that everything will be easy, but it is a guarantee we will be rewarded with victory through Christ. Like it says here, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. That's one of our rewards. The ultimate reward, though, is that relationship in heaven with God, our Creator. That renewed relationship. After all this time, we are separated, but now we're together again. That's what it's like to be a Christian, to be one with God, to be more Christ-like. When we are focused on things above, not the things of this earth, we can show others the glory of God's wonderful news. So as I wrap up here today, I just want to remind you what God has given you. He's given you the opportunity for a relationship with your Creator, God the Father. He's given you the opportunity to step away from the sins of this world, all the, the fleshly desires that we have. He's given you an opportunity to repent from your mistakes and an opportunity to be cleansed white as snow. Will you accept that challenge, that gift? Will you come forward and give your life to Christ? Let that sink in. Thank you.